uh, what I'm going to do is, is go over the sort of uh, thinking that one needs to uh, go through in order to develop a health monitoring program for in-house. And I'm sure all of you have health monitoring programs well in place, quality control programs. Uh, but it's good once in a while, I think, to reconsider uh, the reasons that we're looking for certain organisms and uh, the actual logical basis for what we're doing. Does this control? This is blinking, but it's not going ahead. See, this one. You're using one or two projectors. What? Cool. I would have thought it was the one that said single slides. One of the reasons that we do health monitoring or quality control is to try to uh, assess the background variation. And that concerns us because the ideal research protocol is one that would seek to eliminate all uh, variables except the one that we're studying. Therefore, any difference between experimental groups would be due to our experimental manipulation and not to any extraneous variables. In reality, this is really very difficult to achieve. Uh, there are many types of variables that we can experience uh, or that can interfere with our work, uh, increasing background variation. I think one that a lot of people think of initially is genetic variation. Uh, are the animals the same as they were six months ago? Are the animals from one source the same as another source? Uh, is the, are the differences between one individual and the next uh, the result of genetic variation as opposed to other uh, uh, epigenetic factors? There's certainly a variety of physical factors that can have a role. Uh, I think we all know as laboratory animal veterinarians and pathologists that uh, stress, temperature, uh, Many things can influence the uh, uh, can influence research. Chemical variations, uh, certainly ammonia, pheromones, and primarily what we're going to focus on here are microbiological factors, uh, which are in essence the uh, the basic reason that we do a health monitoring program. <laughs> One thing that I'd like to go through a little bit before we get into uh, more of the actual health monitoring stuff is uh, defining laboratory animals. Uh, many of us uh, tend to think that, that if we know exactly what's there, that somehow the animal is a better quality than if we're not sure uh, everything that's there. Uh, and so we use the term definition for how many of the uh, uh, associated forms of life, bacterial, viral, uh, parasitic, uh, an animal may be uh, associated with. The assumption with this, though, uh, is very important to keep in mind. And, the, and that assumes that the uh, user is able to maintain the animals, uh, I guess, in this condition which they were received, and the same uh, standards that they're accustomed. Uh, animals are characterized or defined by laboratory tests. Uh, I think that a lot of people want a high level of definition of animals, uh, but some of these uh, organisms are important to know about in making healthcare decisions, colony management decisions, uh, and others are just uh, tested for merely to archive information. Well, one status of uh, defined laboratory animals would be axenic, uh, meaning nothing foreign. And it refers to animals uh, generally derived by cesarean section, although embryo transfer uh, certainly could do it. Uh, they need to be maintained in isolators. It implies they are free of all associated forms of life. In practice, we know that they're going to have uh, endogenous retroviruses. But uh, the term axenic implies that they're free of everything. If they're not axenic, uh, they may be associated with a defined flora. Uh, this refers to axenic animals where you give them uh, a certain number of microorganisms and then maintain them uh, under conditions so that you know everything they have. And these would also be animals that are, co that are called notobiotic. Notobiotic would be either axenic or animals where you know every organism uh, with which the animal is associated. An example of that would be just taking an axenic animal, uh, giving them some sort of uh, microbial cocktail, such as these eight organisms, and then having uh, one that we would refer to at Charles River as uh, crass flora. 
there's a big difference between notobiotic and SPF. And I think in uh, principle, we all understand the difference, but that a lot of the time on day-to-day -day basis, we tend to forget. SPF does not mean that you know everything the animal has. It refers to animals that have no evidence, usually based on some well-defined clinical tests uh, of the presence of certain microorganisms. Uh, it should be related to a specific list of organisms. Nobody should ever assume that an animal is free of something that is not on the list. And it also needs to be related to a specific set of tests or methods to detect the organism. For example, atrophic rhinitis in pigs. You can buy pigs that are SPF uh, with one of the P's of which they are SF being uh, the agents of atrophic rhinitis. But that's measured by, uh, or determined by actually measuring the uh, space in the turbinates and not finding more than a certain distance on so many out of so many pigs. Uh, it, it's a very relative thing. Uh, with, even with ser serologic tests, uh, there's some variation in results that may or may not affect the status of the animals. And uh, just VAF is, is, for example, one kind of, uh, of SPF animal, uh, and the name uh, refers to a particular list of, uh, of, of viruses uh, and implies that they're free of certain bacteria and other organisms. But as with any SPF uh, definition, it does not indicate that they are free of opportunistic bacteria. It also does not uh, indicate that they are free of anything that, any viral agent that isn't on the list. So now back to the, the basic question, why are we doing health monitoring? Uh, one of them, of course, the basic reason is that clinically ill animals, whether they get ill during the experiment or before, uh, will not respond reproducibly. I mean, it, we think we all understand that. And, and I'm sure that we all also understand that certain latent infectious agents, uh, which don't make the animal clinically ill or visibly ill, will still uh, interfere with um, uh, the research results. For example, cephatia can interfere with uh, uh, adjuvant arthritis, and Sendai and MHV can interfere with immune function. And, um, that goes on and on. And at the back of the handout, there's a list of, uh, of different agents and some of their research effects. But I'm not going to go through and catalog all of those during this talk. So we know we need to do it. How are we going to go about developing a health monitoring program? Uh, what components should be in it? What should we be looking for? How should we be looking? Uh, in the past, uh, when I was a resident, the basic approach to uh, uh, health monitoring seemed to be diagnostic. Uh, we might look for a few agents, but basically nobody got very concerned unless the animals appeared ill, unless somebody said, you know, these darn uh, rats or whatever just aren't acting right, I'm not getting good results, and then you'd check into it. And the other side that's done much more uh, these days, and is certainly appropriate in uh, most situations, is a routine health monitoring uh, program. And these principles would apply to rats, they would apply to uh, non-human primates, pigs, uh, to any laboratory animals, where samples are routinely taken and examined by well-defined tests for a specific list of agents. So the goal of a screening program is much different than the goal of, a, uh, of clinical uh, diagnosis. Our, the goal is to detect the presence of an organism in a group of animals by detecting the presence in at least one animal. If you find it in one animal, you know the group is positive. And as a result, it's not as important to be 100% sure on each individual sample. If you're looking at multiple samples, you can get a very high uh, statistical degree of confidence by repeating it again and again. Uh, an example of this might be uh, serologic testing for herpes B infection in uh, non-human primates. I've heard uh, that the uh, uh, sensitivity of the test may only be 50%. That is, uh, you may only find 50% of the animals that are actually positive. But if you do enough animals, 50% is good enough over time to get a good assessment of the colony status. For any individual animal, you may only have a 50%. But the goal is not to determine the morbidity or the prevalence of the infection, only to demonstrate whether or not it's present by finding it in at least one animal. 
So in thinking about what we're going to be looking for, I think one of the first uh, considerations may be whether or not it is a primary rodent pathogen. Uh, as a pathologist myself, and I, I know many of you are pathologists, it's disappointing how few viruses really cause any good disease. Uh, most of them tend to be subclinical. But a primary pathogen would be one that is capable of causing epizootic infection. It would be one that could produce some very direct or indirect evidence of its presence and on a significant portion of the population, not one in 10,000 like uh, TEMV or one in 1,000. Uh, infection would produce clinical or histologic disease in a significant portion of the population. And as a practical matter, it's important that rodents be the primary or preferred hosts. And that uh, comes down as a practical matter when we're looking for something. Second thing you might want to consider is has the pathogenic potential of an organism you're considering looking for been adequately established? Now, many organisms are opportunistic. And I think most of the, uh, most of the bacterial disease that we see, uh, perhaps even most of the uh, time when we see clinically ill animals from viruses, it may be an opportunistic infection. Uh, Staph aureus is virtually ubiquitous. It's carried by people, it's, it's, it's on animals, it's everywhere. And yet, once in a while, it will cause some problems. You want to consider that host factors may be very important in uh, determining the pathogenic potential. Uh, it's generally, though, um, again, disappointingly difficult or frustratingly difficult to evaluate the pathogenic potential of many organisms because many case reports are all the, often all that's out there and very often they lack key elements to assess the pathogenicity of a given organism. So what are the uh, key elements that we should find in a case report? Uh, it would be nice that there was isolation and complete identification and serotyping of the organism as far as necessary to actually establish that a particular organism, perhaps even a particular strain was present. Uh, there, are, there are many biotypes of uh, Citrobacter freundii, but only biotype 4280 seems to have any pathogenic potential. And it would be quite uh, similar for uh, uh, E. coli and, and many other organisms. Uh, serologic and culturing procedures should be documented in this uh, to exclude other agents. And I think we've all seen a lot of instances in the literature where somebody uh, finds a, uh, an abscess or finds a disease uh, in an animal, they isolate a particular virus or a particular uh, agent, and, and then from that uh, claim that it's pathogenic. Uh, an example here recently would be carbacillus. Uh, where the initial report of it said uh, in 78 out of, uh, we're describing a, um, an outbreak in the Netherlands in 78, said it was unknown whether or not the, the bacillus had any role in causing the disease at all. Uh, about three case reports later, or four case reports, they'd never found it in an, or, in an animal that didn't also have uh, mycoplasma or sendai or something like that. And by then it was being claimed to be a, a, a clearly established serious pathogen. Since then the pathogenicity of carbacillus has been established. But, but for a long time it was being carried along only uh, guilt by association. It's good to see that a gross and histopathologic exam was done. Uh, not only for employment security, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's nice in, uh, if, if the research isn't working and you find serologic evidence or cultural evidence of something, it's good to look and see that the uh, organism responsible for the uh, uh, adverse or, or unusual research effects uh, might have had some morphologic alteration. It's good to evaluate other host factors. Uh, at least one of the carbacillus papers described it in um, diabetic animals. Uh, well, that uh, might mean that it has an opportunistic uh, role but wouldn't establish it as a pathogen by itself. I guess the bottom line is that in order for these reports to, uh, to really establish the pathogenic role of any agent, uh, they really need to fulfill Koch's postulates. And, and I've been using carbacillus all along. That has been done uh, with carbacillus at this point. But uh, Koch's postulates do need to be fulfilled. If, um, 
just as, a, as an aside, I think that it's worthwhile printing uh, or publishing uh, reports of unusual organisms that can be associated with lesions, uh, sometimes even when Koch's postulates cannot be fulfilled. But I think in those cases, it needs to be very clearly stated uh, you know, in the discussion or somewhere in the paper that uh, the uh, pathogenic role of the organism could not be firmly established because Koch's postulates were not uh, fulfilled. You want to look and see if the agents that you want to look for have any established effects on research. Uh, obviously, clinical signs or dead animals are one effect, and, and those could uh, interfere with, with research. But it's also good to look and see if there's any documentation of additional effects, uh, such as chronic uh, pulmonary inflammation from anything can then interfere with uh, bronchial responsiveness uh, to a variety of challenges. Uh, it's good to look if there's an interaction in an established way uh, with any metabolic, immunologic, or physiologic processes. And then these results or effects should be adequately described in uh, peer-reviewed literature. This all seems so basic, it all seems so common sense, and it's really very hard to find for very many uh, agents uh, in laboratory animal medicine. Other considerations? Uh, certainly, if something is uh, ubiquitous or at least very widespread in the environment, such as Staph aureus, uh, doing, uh, looking for it in particular uh, might be less important, uh, might be less meaningful. Uh, you might want to consider whether agents you're looking for are commonly associated with normal human flora. Uh, I've seen estimates as high as 70 or 80 percent of people uh, will carry strep in their pharynx. Uh, this means that it would be very difficult uh, to exclude strep uh, from any animals that have any contact with humans. And wearing masks is, is good and all that, but uh, uh, one good cough or sneeze can uh, certainly blow around that. So we thought about all these things with a bunch of different agents. Uh, first thing we're going to be looking for are those agents where we know they have significant disease-causing potential or where we know they have some known interference with research. We want to look for things where there's a high probability of detection or where we think they might have a high prevalence in the population. An important consideration is that they might have good potential for exclusion. We could look for endogenous retroviruses, uh, but we can't get rid of them, so what's the point? Uh, it's good to look for things that are of importance to the research community. And obviously, we have to consider whether or not there's any zoonotic potential. Um, and an example of that would be with uh, hantaviruses. And to my knowledge, uh, there's never been a report, uh, or very few reports, at least in the continental United States, I don't know of any, I think, uh, of hantavirus uh, in laboratory animals, found serologic positives in wild-caught animals, uh, some related uh, uh, viral strains have been picked up, uh, I think, outside of the continental United States, and certainly serologic positives have been found in other countries. But even though it's never been found, or even though the uh, probability is exceedingly low, I think the political realities are that we, uh, it is an important agent to go in, to include. After we've uh, in, put on all the primary agents, we want to probably include some opportunistic. Uh, these would be ones that are, tend to be common in the environment of laboratory animals and humans. Uh, strep, staph, uh, tend to have a very low disease incidence, even though they might have a very high prevalence within the population. Uh, they tend to have a high latency potential, uh, very typical for opportunistic bacteria, uh, and are likely to have potential human carriers. So for these, although they may need to be excluded uh, dealing with some, such as Pseudomonas, uh, staph, uh, and dealing with immunodeficient uh, rodents, exclusion really is only possible if you eliminate all human-animal contact. And then it may be necessary to include some miscellaneous organisms. Uh, these would be things that could be recovered by culture, uh, but they either have a limited or non-existent or uh, at least undocumented role uh, as opportunists or pathogens. You know, we can, we can graph this onto a nice little target thing like this with the primary ones. And then getting out here into the fringe, 
these would be like other Pseudomonas species, uh, other than Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which might be here. It would be other, uh, there would be other types of Citrobacter, completely unknown significance. Uh, and there's very little financial justification to include them in uh, what can be a costly health monitoring program. So we have some idea of what we're going to be looking for. What are the actual physical components of a uh, health monitoring program? I think we need to do a complete post-mortem examination. Uh, every animal should be examined grossly. Tissues are generally collected uh, a lot of the time now based only if there are gross lesions uh, present. Uh, a lot of the time screening uh, normal appearing tissue uh, in parallel with doing serology, parasitology, and uh, microbiology is a very limited benefit. Places with uh, sufficient manpower may occasion to do this may occasionally find something. Histopathology, I think, is, I think is extremely useful. Uh, I think we get so focused a lot of the time on serologic diagnosis of the disease uh, that we forget that serology is a series of yes-no questions. Uh, microbiology can, is more like asking, is, will anything grow on this particular media? And histopathology uh, is more asking, is there anything going on in the tissue at all? So it's much more open-ended. It's less likely to give <coughs> Uh, a very specific result, but it's much more open-ended question. However, it takes a lot of time, uh, sometimes in the weeks, and it can be uh, very expensive. However, uh, in um, routine health monitoring, probably wouldn't want to do histopathology. Gross examination is good. Uh, remember, it takes a week or more for animals to seroconvert to a virus. In general, we find that uh, uh, a week is sufficient if uh, had an outbreak, say, of SDA or something like that, that uh, within a week will start picking up seropositives. Uh, but histopathology is diagnostic, and it's diagnostic much quicker. If, so, if you're having an epizootic, don't know what's going on, obviously histopathology can help point in the right direction. Some agents are not uh, able, to be detect able to be detected by uh, serologic or cultural means and uh, histopathology is, is excellent for that. Uh, certainly for nutritional or metabolic or toxic diseases, uh, culture and serology will never help you diagnose uh, scurvy in a guinea pig. Uh, it's probably the only way of determining the incidence of age or strain-related diseases. And if there's any doubt about uh, the results of some other tests, such as uh, serology for carbacillus, bacteria in general or antigenically, magnitudes more complex than viruses, uh, in general tend to, to give more false positives. And so uh, histopathology to confirm carbacillus infection or Tizer's disease uh, is usually recommended. Complete health monitoring program will include microbiology. Uh, we use a combination of general and selective media to get primary isolation. Uh, basically, when you've constructed the list of the agents that you want to be sure to screen for, you just want to be sure that you're using the appropriate media and uh, culturing the appropriate site and from the appropriate age group of animals. For example, Citrobacter freundii uh, really is only possible to find it in the very young animals. Uh, once primary isolates are found, uh, they need to be further identified. And, uh, well, we run about, I think, 20 to 30,000 samples a year for uh, uh, bacteriology, and so we use an automated system. But uh, depending on your needs, that may not be necessary. Parasitology. Uh, I'm very sorry to have missed Dr. Gardner's talk yesterday. Uh, he's an excellent parasitologist and, uh, and I'm sure would have much to contribute on this. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, literature is relatively deficient in recommendations for what is the best overall screening method uh, at, from a health monitoring perspective uh, for laboratory animal parasites. And so there, there are many methods that can be used uh, in looking for internal parasites. Uh, 
a fecal smear uh, is good for things that do not float. It's good for uh, uh, cysts, tapeworm eggs, trematode eggs. Uh, fecal flotation is good as a concentration method for, uh, for eggs that will float. Uh, maceration is probably the best uh, method of determining or of detecting uh, spirurids in the, uh, not spirurids, tracurids, uh, the penworms in the, uh, you know, in, in the guts. Uh, what we do here is we take the intestine, uh, macerate it into a petri dish, incubate it for 15 minutes, 37 degrees with a little saline, and then look at that under uh, low magnification, uh, looking for nematodes. Uh, some of the penworms also uh, transparent adhesive recovery, the scotch tape test, uh, can work, especially if the animal can't be sacrificed. Uh, near as I can tell, and it, it, there hasn't been what I would call an excellent comparison in the, uh, in the literature, this will find about 25% of the uh, animals that are positive for penworms, fecal flotation. Uh, scotch tape test will find about half of them, and then the uh, maceration is the definitive method. Uh, for external parasites, uh, primarily talking about, uh, about mites, uh, just examination of the pelt, carefully parting the hairs, particularly up on the back of the neck, behind the ears, under low magnification is good. Uh, for other things, a skin scraping or even a skin biopsy may be necessary. Uh, finding demodex in older hamsters. Uh, you need to look at the really old hamsters and do a skin scraping. Uh, some things can also be detected on biopsy. Um, getting into actually looking for viruses, uh, most of the time we use serology, and part of the reason that we use serology is that agent isolation and detection that way is just not very practical. Uh, it's very time consuming, it's very expensive, uh, and in, with most of the agents, they're only present for a few days before they're cleared. So you have to look while the virus is still there. You have to have the right cell lines available, and because sampling isn't always successful, and because of these other reasons, even if you don't find it, it doesn't mean anything. So as a research uh, tool or trying to characterize a newly identified virus, it can be very useful, but uh, as far as a health monitoring or screening technique, it just is not very uh, valuable or not very practical. So most of the time looking for viruses, we use serologic techniques looking for antibodies to a particular antigen. Uh, I think that's something that needs to be uh, kept in mind is that we use uh, uh, all laboratories doing serologic diagnosis, use a particular antigen and all they look is for, for antibodies or something in the serum of an animal that will bind specifically to that. When that's found, it's presumed that that must be an antibody to the, uh, to the virus from which the antigen was extracted. And that's usually true. So when it works, serology can tell you if an animal has been previously exposed to specific viruses. And as a series of yes, no questions, when it's successful, you get a series of yes, no answers. Sometimes you get some maybes. Serology, however, cannot tell you when the exposure occurred. All you know is it was long enough ago for the animal to seroconvert uh, with a several day incubation period and perhaps a week to, for seroconversion. Uh, you're up pretty close to two weeks ago. It doesn't tell you how the exposure occurred. It doesn't tell you what the prevalence is, and it doesn't tell you if the virus is still present. So if it's mouse hepatitis virus, uh, which is cleared very rapidly, you, won't, you want to stop breeding the animals to let them all clear the infection, let them uh, clean up the room, those animals are going to always be seropositive, and their offspring may be seropositive by maternal transmission of the antibody. So in interpreting serologic results, you have to consider that no assay is perfect. And as a result, false positive and false negative results do occur. Thankfully with a very low uh, frequency. False negatives, that is the animal is, uh, uh, the agent is actually present in the colony or in the group of animals, serology comes out negative. Uh, this can be because there was a, a low prevalence or maybe only one corner of a room was uh, infected. If you've got multiple strains, maybe only one strain was infected. 
um, in other words, a victim of statistics. We get samples in uh, occasionally from, uh, from nude mice, from skid mice, uh, from transgenic animals of unknown uh, immune status. Uh, that's something to consider. Uh, poor sample preparation or poor sample handling can do it. And also uh, laboratory error. Uh, with the ELISA, uh, we look for a colorimetric change. Uh, laboratories set the threshold for where they start considering that positive uh, at somewhat of an arbitrary level. And so uh, either if the, the antigen is not uh, adequate or the threshold is wrong or this, the lab mixes up the samples, uh, you can actually get uh, uh, negatives that way also. False positives are a little tougher to explain, uh, but they do occur. And I think this is one instance where uh, histopathology uh, can really come in handy. Uh, very frequently, I'm able to uh, find that when an animal has uh, a positive or a tissue culture reaction, uh, serologically to a wide variety of agents. The animal also has an abscess, has a neoplasm. Uh, there seems to be some nonspecific uh, uh, increases in, uh, in positives from animals with uh, inflammation. And this happens when uh, any uh, substance in a specimen, whether it's an antibody or some other material in the, in the serum, will bind non-specifically to the antigen, but not to the tissue control. And, and ELISA tests always have a uh, uh, tissue homogenate control uh, so that when things don't bind to the tissue control, they do bind to the antigen, it's considered positive. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it was, uh, it was the virus. And the hemagglutination inhibition assay, uh, they can occur when the specimen contains non-specific inhibitors of hemagglutination. Uh, it can also happen when the specimens are not uh, prepared or stored properly or with uh, uh, deficiencies in the assay preparation or performance. In other words, lab error can also do it. So when you find positive results, uh, whether bacteriologic or uh, serologic, uh, I think it's always good to confirm them. I suppose that if you had a large and expensive group of animals uh, and you found penworms in them, you might still want to confirm that somehow uh, the lab doing the test hadn't accidentally uh, 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 mixed up samples or made some other error. But I think primarily with uh, 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 serologic testing or in looking at immunodeficient animals for opportunistic agents, it's very important to try to, uh, to test additional animals. Uh, so, for example, if you have a group of skid mice, it's necessary to maintain them free of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, or you don't want Proteus, you don't want uh, staph. You find one of those uh, on health monitoring, that may be a bench contaminant. So you want to test additional animals. If possible, you want to look by alternative test methods. So if, a, if you have a positive on an ELISA, it's good to follow that up with, uh, with an IFA or an HAI uh, to try to confirm the results. Uh, frequently, however, the same sorts of things that will cause a false positive on ELISA will cause the same sample to be false positive uh, by the alternative test methods. And finally, sometimes it may be uh, necessary to try to isolate or detect or uh, use other methods uh, such as um, in situ hybridization or something to uh, detect a particular agent. Well, considering sampling schedules, uh, keep in mind that every group of animals or every animal that you submit for health monitoring or examine for health monitoring, you're really only checking a single point uh, in time. And, and so the number, the frequency with which you look uh, may be altered by the importance or the prevalence of the agents. Uh, in other words, with, with hantaviruses, uh, it's unlikely in any given facility or any given room that that's going to be the first ever reported outbreak of a hantavirus. And so you might want to, uh, if you're trying to conserve money or something, not look quite as often for that as something that has a very high probability of getting into the room. And certainly if something is going to have a great influence on your research, you may want to look a little more, close, a little more frequently than for something that's only of marginal concern. 
You want to consider the physical factors, uh, such as the construction and integrity of the facilities. Uh, many facilities are not capable of uh, a high degree of exclusion. Uh, many times there are animals and biological materials such as cell culture lines that are brought in and out all the time. If that's the case, you may need to look more frequently. Uh, you may want to sample every group of new animals coming in, you may want to sample uh, from a sentinel program within a particular room uh, more frequently. You may want to test the biological materials uh, themselves. Economics play a big role in investigator requirements. Uh, the number of times that you have investigators in and out of a facility, or if those investigators as, uh, are visiting other facilities that may not be of the same microbiologic uh, status as your own, uh, you may need to uh, alter the schedule somewhat. Sentinel animal programs, these are particularly good for uh, uh, when the population in question cannot be directly sampled, uh, such as nude mice, such as animals on a two-year study, you may not want to uh, uh, keep the, uh, the same animals around that long. You may want to use sentinel animals uh, instead in those rooms. Uh, the, but the sentinels should be similar to the population in question. It's very important that they be immunocompetent. They must be housed in a way that is going to maximize the chance of finding a positive sentinel should something actually get into the room. And so what we recommend is that they be housed either in the same cage or in an indirect association with the population you're monitoring. They should be spread around in the room. They should be put on the lower shelves or racks, so anything kicked out of the top. Uh, remember, even uh, uh, particles from a cough tend to settle very quickly if they're larger. And uh, many times it's the larger particles that tend to have the most virus. Uh, oftentimes sentinel animals will be uh, housed with soiled bedding from cages in the population that, they're, uh, that you're monitoring. In general, sentinel animals should be at least eight to 10 weeks of age. Uh, they should be, uh, so they're Im immunocompetent or fully competent. Uh, the gender of the sentinels is not critical. Uh, importantly, and I think this sometimes is forgotten in the rush to set up an excellent sentinel program, it must come from a colony that doesn't have the things that you're going to be looking for. You also have to wait an adequate length of time so that you have a high probability of knowing that the sentinel animals have been exposed to anything in the room, the incubation time has elapsed, the animals have been infected, and then seroconverted. And in general, you want to wait at least four weeks for this. You want to consider the biological factors that may con uh, influence the sampling frequency. Uh, these can be the time from infection to shedding. I think uh, we all know this is important with pinworms. Uh, it can also be important with other bacteria. You need to wait time for an antibody response. Uh, you need to consider the rate or method of spread. Uh, I keep going back to carbacillus. Carbacillus is, is not highly uh, or very rapidly transmissible, and so it'll spread more slowly than uh, something like MHV uh, within a room. If you're looking for effects other than uh, uh, serologic or seroconversion, you may want to wait the time for the maximum morbidity. Certainly it's good to wait uh, long enough uh, to be sure that it's uh, reached its maximum prevalence because the whole uh, numbers game of how many animals do you look at is based on uh, trying to find at least one animal that's positive. And in all this, you really have to balance the costs against the uh, direct or indirect value of the animals and the degree of confidence that you're willing to have. If you have a 95% confidence with every month's testing, then over time, you know that your colony has really been negative on and on. So there is some sort of accrual of, um, of confidence with time, and that's not reflected in the, uh, the basic formula, the ILR formula. And that brings us to the ILR formula. Remember, if it moves, it's biology. If it changes color, it's chemistry. If it does work, it's usually a pathologist. And if it puts you to sleep, it's statistics. 
Well, this is the ILR formula, and I, probably everybody has seen this a number of times. Uh, it's the log of one minus the confidence level that you're looking for, divided by the log of the prevalence. It says incidence, it's actually prevalence. And that'll give you the number of animals to be sampled. So if you only need a 90% uh, confidence level, you only need a 0.1 there. And if you use this formula, it's easy to generate a little table like this where uh, uh, for a 95% confidence with the different prevalence of, uh, of seropositive animals within a population, uh, if you think it's something that 80% of the animals would be seropositive to, then you probably only need to look at two animals. And in general, most of the viruses uh, that we do serology for tend to have a very high prevalence. Um, if we're looking at a group of animals that is seropositive for uh, Sendai or SDA or something like that, even if the uh, uh, seroconversion has occurred relatively recently in a particular group, usually seven or eight out of eight will be positive. However, to be conservative, we usually uh, look at eight animals, which sort of comes out roughly to about a 35% prevalence. With all statistical formulas, there's, uh, there are some assumptions. Uh, with this, most of these assumptions uh, refer to uh, uh, one sample being, uh, one individual animal having the same chance of being positive as the next animal. So that if you know there is a, uh, uh, you have 100 animals, there, you assume there are 35 that are uh, seropositive, uh, you don't want the chance of the next one being positive to be changed by uh, removing the first couple animals. Uh, it assumes that the agent is randomly dispersed. In other words, every animal has an equal chance of being positive. And that sex or other, other factors that you might uh, uh, not be controlling for in your sampling don't alter the incidence within the group. It also assumes that you know the actual prevalence of seropositive animals. And although I can say generally it's very high, uh, many times for some, and for some agents, you don't really know what the, what the incidence will be. It also assumes that the testing is 100% accurate. The last one is relatively easy to control for. If you think your testing is only uh, 90 or only 50% accurate, you just do twice as many animals. It's a very simple linear relationship between the number of animals you need to look at and the, uh, uh, the accuracy of the test. We recommend that at least two age groups be sampled, uh, retired breeders and young adults. Uh, retired breeders are more likely to have false positives, but with some agents, uh, particularly those uh, that are persistent, uh, they are more likely to be uh, uh, seropositive, such as mycoplasma. Uh, some viruses tend to affect animals uh, several months into life instead of uh, uh, weanlings or neonates, as we usually think. Uh, some of the parvoviruses, for example, might be more likely to be positive in the older animals. However, you don't want to, a disadvantage of waiting for the, all the older animals is uh, uh, well, anyway, you want to look, look at some young ones also. So if you're looking for multiple agents, you want to base the number of animals you're going to be looking at at what you think the lowest uh, morbidity is. In other words, which, which agent is going to have the lowest prevalence in the room? We look at eight animals, or recommend eight, uh, based on about a 35% uh, assumed uh, prevalence of seropositive animals. Uh, six weeks is uh, seems to be a good starting point for this. Uh, six week intervals, look at them every six weeks. The, um, you can go through all of the, if you notice this, you can go through all of the reasons on why you're going to do things, how you're going to build this program, and then when it comes down to it, you just pick some arbitrary things. Uh, eight animals is based on a 30 to 35 percent morbidity. That's probably actually low. Uh, six week interval, uh, this is, for most people, a good balance between uh, financial considerations and the chance of something actually getting in. Instead of looking at eight animals every uh, six weeks, it might be better to look at four animals every two weeks. 
you'll be looking at more animals, but it'll also uh, uh, give you a little more frequent monitoring of something that might have a higher incidence. And although generally it doesn't matter which sex uh, is sampled, uh, just to uh, not introduce any uh, sampling bias there, it's probably good to sample both sexes in case a particular agent does have some sort of uh, sex predilection. Usually the uh, screening tests that are run are, are grouped together. Uh, the term that I think is most commonly used probably is profiles for these groups of tests uh, that are run. Uh, so you can have different levels of them for serology. Uh, we term them tracking assessment and assessment plus, but it basically is just a, a, a small group of the agents that is most likely to be introduced, a little more extensive list, and then uh, pretty much everything that we have a test for. Uh, microbiology, remember in microbiology, the most important thing is where you look and which media you use. And once you've selected those, you can, you can make a very exhaustive list by just putting down everything that's likely to grow on those media. But uh, select the most important agents you want to look for and then be sure that the media and the sites that you test are adequate for those. Uh, and finally, uh, parasitology, you can, uh, there are different screening profiles for that also. Usually we don't uh, routinely look at uh, uh, do histopathology. Some special screens may be uh, helpful at some times. Uh, clinical chemistry, certainly for the LDV, uh, lactate dehydrogenase elevating virus. Uh, hematology uh, may help address certain concerns. Stress testing is a good way to, uh, or, or disease provocation uh, through immunosuppression, uh, is a good way to try to identify agents that might not be uh, otherwise evident in a colony and can be a good follow-on to uh, questionable results such as for C. poliforme or uh, C. couturae. MAP testing, uh, mouse antibody product, uh, production, uh, you also can do it in rats, call it RAP testing or hamsters, call it HAP testing. It's where cell lines are injected into, uh, homogenized, injected into an animal and then you see if the animal sero converts uh, to any of the, a particular list of agents. That's a good way of screening uh, biological materials being introduced into an animal facility. Unfortunately, with all of this, there really is no standard uh, profile uh, in the United States. In Europe, there's been a proposed uh, FALASA guidelines, the Federation of European Laboratory Animal uh, Societies. I don't know where the other A is. Uh, but there isn't anything quite uh, like that in the United States. Uh, in general, uh, some viruses and a few bacteria in mycoplasma, and very few parasites, have really been adequately studied and reported in the peer-reviewed literature uh, with respect to their pathogenesis and impact on research. And I think all of us need to balance the needs of our, uh, of our investigators uh, against the financial considerations and the uh, um, the actual scientific uh, documented significance. It's very important that before you put this great plan of health monitoring into uh, play uh, that you have a plan of action. You have to think about all the physical facilities, the investigator needs, uh, the resources, the risk associated with specific agents. Uh, you need to know what information you're going to be gathering, and it's very good to have one person screening it all or reviewing all of the information that's gathered. And that way, uh, it just keeps the lines of communication clear and you get, very, or you get fewer unpleasant surprises down the road. You have to know how to interpret the findings, and it's good in advance to have a plan of action if you do confirm some positive results or, or if you get some positive results. Uh, after you get your first seropositive is not the time to start thinking about uh, uh, what next. You always want to question the accuracy of lab results. I don't think I can say this enough. I've seen too many times where someone has sent away two or three animals for uh, uh, serology. One of them has turned up positive. They've eliminated 
an entire group of animals in the middle of a critical protocol and in doing so saved serum maybe from another 10 animals and it turned out that it was all just a false positive. You have to question the lab. You don't want to go ahead and make decisions based on unverified results and you want to uh, identify all the confounding variables that can influence the interpretation of the lab results. Got this? This is um, the point of this is that as the incidence of true positives declines, in other words, I've been using hantavirus. If you get back a serologic positive for hantavirus, the, the incidence of true positives is exceedingly low. The incidence of false positives is very low also, but it sure is higher than the incidence of true positives. And so for hantavirus, the predictive value from a single sample is going to be very low. If the, if the incidence of true positives was very high, then this would come out to be very close to one and it would have a predicted value of almost 100%. But as the incidence of true positives drops below the incidence of false positives, uh, you know, the predictive value uh, becomes quite low. And the incidence, I think, of false positives on most of these serologic tests is less than 1%. It may be uh, one in a thousand but many times it still is higher than the incidence of true positives. So if you've confirmed the results, uh, you have to decide whether or not you're going to keep the animals, nuke them or not. It's good to check the literature, find out, uh, just sort of freshen up, uh, refresh yourself on whether or not it causes a persistent infection, something to consider, whether or not the virus might actually be gone by the time you find it, and, and how it might influence the particular research. All research is critical. We ought to just eliminate this from the slide. Uh, I mean, many times these days with uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, if a particular agent hits or um, compound hits the market, they expect to be bringing in a million dollars a day on it. You don't want your name to be associated with a delay. So uh, <laughs> it's negative waves. Uh, so want to consider that want to consider how likely it is to spread to other colonies. If it's something you can contain, you may be able to tolerate a little more than if it's something that's going to spread like wildfire. And if you eliminate it, suppose you find a staph uh, in some animals that you, where you really just don't want staph. Even if you eliminate those animals and bring in new ones, if you can't prevent reinfection, uh, then you may want to uh, uh, live with it a little more. If you decide not to keep the colony, you just want to be sure that in getting rid of it, you don't spread it around. You want to use sealed bags. And you want to be sure to disinfect the room adequately. You can't just kill the animals and bring in more. In general, people don't keep the uh, colony if the agent they find is zoonotic. Uh, many of the viruses in particular seem to have immunologic impacts. Uh, if you're doing immunologic research, maybe more likely to be of importance, uh, if it, or if it hits the organ or tissue that's the target of your research. Uh, agents that cause a persistent infection uh, may be of more impact, particularly if you're using uh, cell lines. You don't want to get a persistently infected cell line. And obviously, if you can't prevent it spreading to other uh, rooms in your facility or to other colonies, that may be a consideration. However, if you, if you decide not to keep the colony, uh, you want to take action to prevent it reoccurring. The best way is to know where it came from. Consider all the possibilities. Uh, you want to consider that it may have come from the vendor. It may have been uh, introduced in transit or wild rodents or contaminated materials. If they show up with a viral infection, though, unless they've been in transit a long time, they didn't get it in transit. Uh, if they get a viral infection three weeks after arrival uh, and actually develop clinical signs from it, it may not have come from the vendor. Want to improve facilities and procedures to be sure it doesn't happen again. If it's an agent that's very difficult to exclude, whether it's Staph aureus, pneumocystis, um, even the coronibacterium associated with scaly skin, might be necessary to uh, consider using isolators. Uh, what might want to test biological materials, uh, mouse antibody production test or wrap test or whatever. 
Uh, if you decide to keep the colony, you want to prevent the spread. Limit access to it, few people in and out as possible, disinfect everything that comes out of the room, maybe even move the animals off site. Uh, flexible film isolators are another good way of containing uh, an infectious agent. Uh, if it's not a persistent virus, may be able to break the cycle just by stopping breeding for about six weeks. Uh, after six or eight weeks, introduce some sentinel animals, wait a while, see if they seroconvert, and then uh, uh, if they don't, then probably you've eliminated the virus. Obviously, cleaning up the environment is going to be very important. Remember that a routine health monitoring system is only an imperfect early or late, depending on the agent, warning system. You do get false positives and false negatives. It doesn't eliminate the need for a diagnostic program to follow up on uh, uh, any particular problems or, or agents that may not be included in the health monitoring screening program. And it has to be coupled with regular clinical observation and mortality records. Uh, nothing will replace the daily observation of the animals. Uh, quality control is a, a never-ending uh, thing. You never know what's going to happen. So, anyway, thanks. thank you. Do it.